Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome David Jensen to the show. He is the author of The Naked Interview, Hiring Without Regret. And hiring and picking the right people are obviously very important to any business person. And David will tell us more about how we can be successful with that. David, welcome. How are you? I'm terrific. How are you, Jason? Good, good. It's good to have you uh, coming to us from L.A. on this Friday afternoon. Business owners wrestle with this. I have for many, many years myself, and a bad hire can be a disaster. How do we avoid those those problems of picking the wrong people? Well, you're uh, completely correct, and I've heard that many times. Uh, again, thank you for having me. We just launched the release of The Naked Interview, Hiring Without Regret. And basically, when I was doing business consulting, which I did for almost the last 20 years, I found that there were two common deficiencies that business owners were running into, primarily small business owners, but I think it affects everybody from mom and pop and home-based businesses all the way to uh, major corporations, which was the fact that uh, marketing was always an issue and personnel was a major issue, bringing in the right people. I, I would agree. Those are the two major issues. I would definitely agree with that. So when it comes to the hiring part of it, I mean, you know, I guess it all really starts with where we try to hire from. Craigslist is certainly a very common source nowadays. Of course, there are the websites that are designed for it. There are headhunters out there. You know, maybe start with that and then let's kind of weave our way into the interview and go from there. Very good. Well, the first things that uh, I suggest someone do, I call the 10 truths. And I've put the 10 truths together so that somebody could pick up the book and read the 10 truths and kind of go immediately from there as kind of a, uh, a quick start, if, uh, if you will. These um, just include um, making sure that you're diligent and not desperate, making sure that you do make sure that you even need to make a hire in an area. Oftentimes, Joe will be overloaded in an area and slowing things production down while Mary is completely productive and doing the job of three different people. So I encourage the business owners look around and find where they can increase production without having to make a hire in the first place. And then when they go into the hiring stage, sure, Craigslist is a source, jobs.com, many monster jobs. There are a lot of different sources out there where you can get interview pools But I also ask people to look into local businesses or friends that they have to ask them for referrals and people, because you're inviting someone into your business and it's like inviting someone into your family. 
It sure is. You know, they say you you never really know someone until you either hire them or marry them, right? That is true. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a that's a good point, you know, to to really determine if we can avoid hiring altogether, which is surprising to hear from someone in your position. <laughs> but I, I think that's very good advice. Can we outsource? Can we use technology? But say we've decided we can't. We really do need to hire. And any suggestions, and I don't even know if this is an area you really cover or specialize in, you know, maybe what we put in the posting, if it's on, say, Craigslist, maybe we can get people to disqualify themselves or filter themselves or self-sort and self-select for the position. And, you know, I, I, I would say also with that comment, one of the problems with a lot of these websites, including Craigslist, is that a lot of candidates don't read the post. They just reply, here's my resume. <laughs> That's true. And and actually, in uh, one of the first chapters of the book, I cover uh, deciding to hire and evaluating what your needs are. Because when you're bringing somebody on, there's an incredible HR staffing cost. There's interviewing time. There's the time of checking references and the salary that you're adding and all of those different costs that are incurred. And so it's very important to make sure that that primary step is done. But when you do go into the hiring process, I do ask that you evaluate what your needs are and give a really good job description so that people are self-editing uh, themselves. Okay. Once we get to the point of maybe that first phone call or email connection, and then, of course, it's the interview. So take it where you want from there. Well, great. Well, uh, before the interview, obviously, there are uh, phone interviews. And I do request that when you, one of the 10 truths actually is uh, in phone screening, you should hear them smile. And I think it's very important that when you're speaking to somebody over the phone, you can hear that they actually have an interest and an excitement and an understanding of what they're getting themselves into rather than just checking you off on a list of a dozen interviews they have to go to. Then uh, it's a matter of bringing the person in and seeing that they are uh, presentable and that they're someone who would fit into the family that you have in that corporate structure, whatever that may be. I know many companies that surveil uh, candidates right from the parking lot all the way into the building to make sure that oftentimes someone will come in and present a different image than they themselves truly will be beyond that in the workplace. So I ask them to the first time, just kind of meet and greet them, do some brief interview questions, and then to call them back for a second interview. You wouldn't believe how many times I've had a guy come in dressed sharp in a suit or a, a, a uh, freshly pressed dress shirt. And then the next time he comes back, he's in jeans and sneakers and he's all comfortable. And we haven't even completed the interview process. I, I don't know if anybody dresses up anymore. <laughs> it's sad to say, <laughs> but the way candidates come in for uh, job interviews nowadays, it has blown my mind. And I just kind of gave up on the whole dress thing. But, you know, maybe still in the very strict corporate world, it, it still exists. Uh, any comments on that? Well, you know, I, I have a chapter in the book called uh, or I have a chapter at the end of the book, which uh, tells about the advice that I give to uh, which is for my second book, actually called Get Hired, which is interviewing from the other side of the desk and encouraging candidates to apply some rules to themselves. But from that viewpoint, I do believe that people should dress for success. And obviously, if you're going to get a job as a mechanic at your uh, you know, local service shop or whatever, you're not going to wear a suit and tie. But you should wear a non-stained or non-ripped pair of jeans, and you should wear a decent uh, you know, polo shirt or something of that sort to make yourself presentable. And you should continue to have that pride in your workplace, no matter what the dress code is. Good advice, certainly. Any suggestions on hiring remote staff, whether they be employees or contractors? A lot of businesses nowadays have become very virtual and very widespread in their dealings. I mean, my business has employees all over the country. We've certainly tried the offshore thing and uh, haven't had much success with it, I tell you. So we're, we're pretty much confined to within the U.S., but, you know, we have a lot of people working for us that we've never met. You know, most of those hires have been pretty good. But what if you can't meet them in person or, you know, at least not easily and, and you don't intend to meet them in person? That's a terrific question. Uh, and I don't cover that really specifically in the book. What I do cover in the book, and but I can give you my personal advice on it, is that 
One, uh, always look for products. Look for something that when the resume comes in and you start to do reference checks or you do some testing on the individual, look for something that they can prove their worth or prove their value or prove their actual previous products. I find that if someone asked me what is the one thing that I should make sure I get done in an interview before I hire someone, it's to really verify that they can produce what you've evaluated that you really need for your company. And any advice on how to do that, though? Well, you know, oftentimes, say you need a graphic designer or something for a website, I would ask them to produce something uh, or to show you products that they've gotten in the past. And then, of course, when you make an actual hire, you put somebody on a trial basis. Most states nowadays are, uh, you know, a hiring at will uh, scenario where you can put them on a 30, 60, 90 day trial and make sure that they do start to fit in with your culture and what you're looking for. David, give us an example of some great interview questions we can use, and, and also not just the questions, but maybe some coaching on, on what kind of answer we should expect and how, how we can evaluate that answer. Great. You know, Jason, I like to change it up when I'm asking interview questions. A lot of people end up in, in a box, and I like to go outside the box. It's funny. I, I have a friend who used to hire for franchises, and one of the questions he would ask was, how would you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And I always thought that was pretty funny. And uh, he said, well, you know, if somebody just says I'd put two pieces of the bread together and put the peanut butter and jelly in between, I knew that they you know, weren't very creative or they didn't uh, think outside the box. And now I don't suggest questions like that. But what I do ask is things like, if you were to liken your last job to say a football or a baseball or some other sports team, what role do you think you played in that team and how would you position yourself? So were you a quarterback? Were you a you know, running back going through the trenches? Or were you on defense and always tackling problems? And when you do that, it usually lightens up the atmosphere, even if they don't even know the sport. They will laugh about it a little bit and they'll let down some of that guard and they'll give you a bit more honest answer. And oftentimes that's where someone will turn and say, oh, I just hated my last job and I was always arguing with my supervisor. And red flags like that come up quite simply in a casual conversation where they wouldn't normally come up in a true interview where you're just asking, who was your supervisor? What was your salary? Did you expand this area and things of that sort? Well, you know, another thing I uh, suggest that some find uh, new and interesting is if you're looking at bringing on a high level executive and someone that's going to really be key in the future expansion of a company, I suggest that you take them out to dinner, invite them to bring their spouse or, uh, you know, a partner with them as well, and just have them out to dinner with you and maybe another key exec of yours so that you can evaluate how their social skills are, how the camaraderie works, and if you could really see yourself moving forward into the future with this person or whether they're there just to punch a clock. No question about it. That's good. And, and getting, to, getting to meet their spouse and you know, all of that on a social level obviously will get you a lot more information about them and you can make a better decision. However, most people are so busy nowadays, they don't necessarily have a chance to do that. And that's probably reserved for more of a high level hire that's, that's going to cost you more money and be more fundamental to your business, right? Absolutely. I would definitely reserve that for board members, vice presidents, things of that sort. With regular candidates, it often then moves into the avenue of reference checks and making sure that when you call in a reference check, you're not talking to that person's brother-in-law or their best friend or something of that sort, but that you're really talking to somebody that worked intricately with them at their last company and asking them about their duties and responsibilities and why that candidate left that company and how they handled conflict when they were at that company and what their big accomplishments were when they were at that company and things of that sort. That will reveal a lot as to whether that person was of value to that company and would then create these same type of impressions with you along their time working with you. Yeah, they certainly would. And, and any concept on like the format of interviews for, you, you specialize really in helping small businesses hire people. Usually their budgets aren't large, their time is very limited. Any suggestions on the format there? Is it the first call, 
one interview, multiple interviews. Do you recommend people use, for example, and there are legal issues here too, you may want to address, but like personality testing devices, Myers-Briggs or disk profiling has been used a lot. Do you have any thoughts on that as well? You know, I do. Um, And I actually have a system that uh, is being developed right now and will be soon available through uh, the company I have that delivers our consulting with hiring, which is called the Hiring Academy at uh, thehiringacademy.com. That product will include a simple system that can be applied in any business of any size and will take those 10 truths and all of the steps and break them down into a very simple turn the page and ask the next question style interviewing process. Along the way in that, there is some testing, which includes like a basic IQ test, a basic aptitude test, and a test I developed uh, myself, which is a, um, a uh, what I call the hiring potential analysis. And it's similar to those other tests you mentioned in the sense that it evaluates areas of purpose and productivity and ability to consider others in a team environment and things of that sort. So testing is a a very big step of bringing someone on nowadays. And any questions or, or things from that test that you want to share? You know, I don't have that test in front of me, but it is something that I have a sample available on the website, along with you can download the 10 truths directly. But my big purpose is to help others uh, overcome the problems of hiring because I saw how intensely it affected business owners when I was out as a consultant. There are many marketing gurus. There are many materials available on marketing. But I really found that hiring was an area that uh, was shied away from. And most business owners said, I hate hiring and didn't even want to study the subject because they hated it so much. So trying to give a little bit more of a quick and painless solution so that they can really feel like that their gut instinct is correct and feel good and basically hire without regret. Yeah, no question about it. I think most business owners feel that way and any any relief from that pain can be very, very helpful. What other interview questions do you want to share? And then let's move on to onboarding after that. Okay, great. You know, other interviewing questions would be um, along the lines of uh, exactly what I was saying with the reference checks as well of what products were there? What were you proud of that you produced at your last job or or job prior to that? What things um, do you feel are in your bucket list with regards to business accomplishments. You know, what do you want to create with your future from your job? And you may say, well, well, hold on. If I'm hiring a receptionist for my company or whatever, she's not going to have her bucket list of accomplishments. But often you find that someone comes in and they they factually have an interest in an area that they're applying for in that job that they want to continue to expand on. They want to learn more about and they want to grow a career with a company. And those are things that are true tells of somebody who may be with you for a long time there for it and will be very loyal and go that extra mile when you need them. And that's probably the most important thing that I can hear come up in an interview is somebody talking about their purpose, somebody talking about having a career there. And uh, I always ask questions looking for that. What about onboarding? You know, so you've made the decision. Well, actually, before we get to onboarding, anything about the the offer letter, the comp plan, do you advise on those types of things? I don't really uh, get into the legal rudimentary areas that often just due to the fact that... Uh, they, they change from state to state and, you know, they're always changing. So do, uh, and I, I understand that. They do. And it's the number one area of complaint when you try and advise on someone. They say, oh, no, you can't do that legally. So I try and just keep with the real basics and making sure that when you sit down with a person, you're asking them uh, questions that maybe are outside the box but are not illegal. But, you know, like what uh, a great question I love is what is your former employer likely to say about you? And then, you know, they'll they'll originate, oh, he'll probably say, you know, this or that or the other. And then, of course, when you do your phone reference check, you can really verify whether that person had a good handle on where they stood with that supervisor and with that company, which I think is real important. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Well, let's talk a little bit about onboarding, if we can, and, you know, making that relationship go well. Any Any tips there? 
Absolutely. Uh, when you bring somebody in, I think the first thing to really understand is that they're excited about getting a job. And oftentimes for you, you're just bringing a person on to fill a hole and to handle a headache for yourself. And so I really, uh, I really suggest that when you bring somebody on, you're making a decision that's a big financial decision, whether it's a $10 an hour employee or you know someone's going to be on a larger six-figure salary. And you should make a big deal about it. You should really congratulate them. You should make sure that all your I's and you know are dotted and all your T's are crossed on your paperwork. But at the same time, you should really make them feel welcome. What I suggest to HR departments and business owners is to make sure that before they even come in, that you have an unalterable space for them to work from. You know, set up a desk for them, put a stapler on it and a computer on it, and maybe even a little name tag. So they really feel welcome and know this is my job, this is my space. And then really introduce them to their coworkers and their supervisor and give them kind of that hat, if you will, you know, the, the policeman's hat, the fireman's cap, and this is your job and these are the functions of it so that they can just get right to work and not feel lost in the work environment. I think just all too often in the, in the push and pull of daily life and the busyness and everything going on, small business owners have to wear so many hats that a lot of that gets lost, doesn't it? At first, it it becomes a desperate hire situation. That's the first mistake and the first problem cropping up there. And then you do get someone and maybe they're even really good, you know, even, even if you did it as a desperate hire and then not onboarding them correctly, it really kind of sours the start of the relationship, doesn't it? It does. It uh, It's what you're trying to avoid in the first place, which is personnel problems and, and distancing them. And if you want somebody's help, then you have to give them some help as well. No question about it. Well, good. David Jensen, thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Again, the book is The Naked Interview, Hiring Without Regret. You can find that at Amazon.com. I believe on Apple's iBook store as well, right? Absolutely. And it should be in uh, Barnes & Noble's uh, uh, by this time as well. And otherwise, you can just come straight to our website at thenakedinterview.com or our parent company, The Hiring Academy. Great. Well, David, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Have a great rest of the week and weekend ahead. You know, Penny, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Britt. Jason actually has a six-book set on creating wealth that comes with over 100 hours of the most comprehensive ideas on investing in business. They're in high-quality digital download audio format, ready for your car, iPod, or wherever you want to learn. Yes, and by the way, he's recently added another book to the series that shows you investing the way it should be. This is a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Jason actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets that are untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches us how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. He's recorded interviews with Harry Dent, Peter Schiff, Robert Kiyosaki, Pat Buchanan, Catherine Austin Fitz, Dr. Dennis Waitley, T. Harv Eker, and so many others who are experts on the economy, on real estate, and on creating wealth. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered with a savings of $385. Now to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series complete with over 100 hours of audio and six books, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. 